All right. So um, we're going to finish up talking about binary classification, um, the discriminative, discriminative met methods for binary classification. Um, and this is all for uh, linear, met linear methods. Um, but we're going to uh, sort of close out by talking about um, other uh, more sort of classical interpretations of logistic regression and support vector machines so that you can get a more well-rounded education here. Um, but before I go into that, I'd like to talk about ridge terms and ridge regularization. Um, so ridge regularization can be added to the programs that I've already mentioned, um, just like we added it to um, the least squares objective. You just say add in lambda times the sum of the squares of the betas for, um, to, to the empirical risk here. Um, and so SVMs, without the ridge term, it actually has a non-unique solution. You can imagine that the um, that uh, because of the linearity, uh, the piecewise linearity of the the loss, you you might have this these uh, issues of non-unique solutions. So we always include it in support vector machines. Typically, it's not too hard to tune lambda. It's not very um, sensitive to tuning of lambda, and then all of a sudden, if uh, lambda becomes too extreme, then it then it'll give you uh, bad values. But this is not sort of a, a in, typically this is not going to be a make or break term. It's just something we add in for numerical stability. Logistic regression um, often will run without the ridge penalty by default, but you can add it in just fine. Um, there's there's nothing forcing you to to not include it. Um, I would say that the narrative is just the same as its narrative for ordinary least squares. It shrinks the betas towards zero, but doesn't force any any to be exactly zero, as uh, as like what happens with the lasso. Um, so one way that you can fit this uh, is using scikit-learn. You can take, for example, logistic regression in a linear model uh, module in scikit-learn and then add in the L2 penalty. Um, and this C is just one over lambda. It's the, um, it's uh, because they fit the constrained version. Um, and in the constrained version, the C, the constraint takes the place of, of one over lambda. So you can fit it just like, um, like every other uh, regression model or classification model in scikit-learn. And then uh, you can predict on the the test error, and then just see how many um, how many you are wrong. You can either use this or use the uh, metrics package in Scikit-Learn. This is sort of the simpler thing. Just see if y hat is different from the um, the y test, and then take the mean of that. Um, so for SVMs, you can do something similar. You can set c also equal to one over lambda and then um, define the kernel to be linear. So we're gonna talk about kernel support vector machines in the future, but at the moment, um, we've only mentioned um, uh, linear support vector machines. And uh, what we've seen so far is, is what gets implemented if you set kernel to linear. And you can fit and predict in the same way that you've been doing this for all of the other um, methods for, for regression and classification. Um, if you want to compute a score, you have to um, actually apply the betas to the uh, test points, and you can just extract what the betas are and then apply it to the test points, for example. Um, once you have this score, you can then... There's also uh, possibly soft... Uh, there, there may be more than one way to do this, but this is this is one way to do this. Um, then we can compute ROC curves and precision recall curves um, because we went over this last time, um, and then uh, and then look at the um, and then look at the misclassification error for the data set. Um, and these misclassification errors don't uh, look too much different on the test set. Um, it's quite common that logistic regression with the same penalty parameters. Uh, will perform very similarly to SVMs with the linear kernel with the same penalty parameters. And that's because the losses don't uh, significantly differ all that much. They have very similar properties. 
Um, really, the difference is when we use different kernels than the linear kernel for support vector machines. And we see that in the ROC curve for this data set. Um, we see that logistic regression, SVMs, and that duration parameter. So this is with the, um, with the same data set that we've been working with, um, the banking data set thus far, um, that the duration parameter, uh, the duration um, just using that variable as the score, they all work, they all give similar ROC performance. And same with the PR curve, if you look at SVMs and, and logistic regression, they all perform relatively similarly to duration with perhaps duration working better uh, for small recall values. Okay, um, so a classical narrative for the logistic regression is actually through a logistic model. So the basic, um, the basic assumption is that if you calculate the log odds of y being one given x, then you assume that that is linear in the, in the input. And so uh, specifically, the main logistic model assumption is that if you take the probability of y equal one given x divided by the probability that y equals minus one, the other, um, the other value here, and this could be just as well encoded as a zero, um, if you take the log odds, so these are the odds, if you take the log odds here, that's equal to x transpose beta, this linear term. And remember, I typically will absorb an intercept into this uh, linear function, so beta is in rp plus 1. And it, so if you look at the minus log of the probability that y is equal to little y given x, this is, um, this is the, your log likelihood. And I claim that this is equal to the logistic loss. And so uh, logistic regression is just um, a maximum likelihood estimation, which means that we're going to minimize the negative log likelihood um, uh, with respect to this logistic model, for this logistic model. To verify this, if you just take log of uh, minus L of beta x1 over minus L of beta x minus 1, so if you plug in y equals 1 and y equals minus 1, then uh, negative minus L is the, um, sorry, this is, this is not quite correct. Um, okay, um, so I, I made the correction here. Um, so to verify this, we just need to take the um, probabilities, and we need to see what the log odds are for these given probabilities. So to calculate these probabilities, we just need to take this, the negative of this, exponentiate it, and we get back our probabilities. So let's do that. We have exponential of negative L of uh, when y is equal to 1, and then the same thing over the same thing when uh, y is equal to minus 1. If we calculate this out, we end up just getting that uh, we have the minus um, the likelihood at 1, which is here, uh, minus negative likelihood at minus 1, which is here. And so if we look at what this is, we can, we can bring uh, these logs together, and then we get log of 1 plus exponential of beta transpose x over 1 plus exponential of minus beta transpose x. Um, so if, if we look at what this is, one way that we can write this is just as exponential of x transpose beta. To see that, we can just um, we can just add and subtract um, an e to the minus x transpose beta term uh, here, and then uh, of course that's just equal to x transpose beta. So this verifies that the loss function that I gave you before is also the negative log likelihood um, um, under the logistic model. So the nice thing about this model is it, is it gives you a very natural way to extend this from binary classification to multi-class classification, because you can just imagine the log odds for any other class being a linear function, each of them having their own beta vectors. We'll talk about multi-class classification in the, in the near future. Okay, so for support vector machines, the typical narrative is a little bit different. 
So the way that it starts is we say, let's suppose that our um, classification problem is linearly separable. And by that, mean we, by that we mean we can draw a hyperplane such that all of the positive samples are on one side and all the negative samples are on another side of the hyperplane. So this is an example of, uh, of separators, linear separators. Now the question is, there's a lot of different separating lines, so which one should we choose? Right? So you can imagine moving this line around, all of them, there's an infinite number of possible separator lines such that the positive uh, samples are on one side and the negative samples are on another side. Um, so the way that we think about this is uh, via a margin. So the margin, the basic idea is that we have a pair of lines which are defined by x transpose beta equals plus or minus one. So you can imagine that there's two lines here one is x transpose beta is equal to 1. 1 is x transpose beta equals minus 1. And um, this is a margin if, uh, if all of the positives lie on one side of one line and all of the negatives lie on the other side of another line. That's, that's what we mean by a margin. And there always exists such a, uh, such a thing for linear, linearly separable um, data, for separable data. Um, and what this means is that y is equal to plus 1 implies that x transpose beta is greater than or equal to 1, and y equals minus 1 implies x transpose beta is less than or equal to minus 1. And this requires linear separability. This won't necessarily happen if we don't have linear separability. Um, and so if we look at what this means, that means that um, our data is separable if and only if you can find a beta such that yi of xi transpose beta is greater than or equal to 1. So this is the way that you can think about it, is that there's some line, this is x transpose beta equals 0, and two other lines where it's x transpose beta equals 1 and x transpose beta equals minus 1, and all the data falls outside of the margin. So that's what a margin is. So we're going to choose the one with the largest margin width. So you can imagine thinking about the width of this margin. And um, the margin width is the smallest distance between these points. And so if you think about what the distance, one way to express the distance between these points, let's imagine an x point such that it's equal to alpha times beta over the norm of beta. So beta over the norm of beta is a unit vector that's normal to this plane. And it's a unit vector that's normal to this plane. So the distance to this line here, to this hyperplane, for a given x is going to be equal to um, the, uh, how you can construct the, um, the uh, so, so it's, it's equal to the projection of x onto that normal unit vector. Um, so one way that we can do that is just by multiplying uh, the unit vector by alpha and getting a point that lies outside of this margin. Right? And so we have this x sub alpha is equal to alpha times this, this unit normal. And so it's exactly on one side of the margin when alpha times, uh, when x transpose beta is equal to 1, and it's exactly on the other side when that's equal to minus 1. But if we look at what x transpose beta is, and that's equal to alpha times the norm of beta, because we just take beta transpose beta over the norm of beta, and that gives us the norm of beta back. So that tells us that alpha, in this case, is either equal to uh, 1 over norm of beta or minus 1 over the norm of beta. And the margin width is just 2 times 1 over the norm of beta. right? So we're drawing a point here and drawing a point over here, right? And that's uh, going to be alpha times the um, beta over the norm of beta and minus alpha over beta times the norm of beta. And so the dis distance between these two is going to be 2 over the norm of beta. So the margin width is inversely proportionate to the norm of beta. And you can kind of get some sense of this. If I increase beta, the, the, just the magnitude of beta, I'm not changing the direction, but I'm definitely going to change the width of this margin. So you can imagine the direction of beta is determining where this hyperplane is. 
in space, what the separating hyperplane is, black line. And the norm of beta is just determining which, um, what the width of this margin is. And so we're trying to select a beta with minimum norm if we want to maximize the margin width. And that's the basic idea behind a margin. Now, um, there's going to be a certain limit to the, to the width of this margin. You can't increase the width any more than this without, uh, without having the, the points no longer lie outside of this margin. And if we increase the width of this any more, some of these points would fall inside of the margin, which would violate our margin condition. So this gives us a way of selecting a separating hyperplane. And this was the, um, this was one of the main concerns that early computer scientists who were working on support vector machines had about um, this, uh, this problem. So now what happens if our data is not linearly separable, right? Um, so if it's not linearly separable, then, um, then you can't find such a separating hyperplane. So what they did instead is they introduced the, what they call slack variables. And these are just slack, these are just um, distances by which you would move the, move the points that were, that were hard to correctly classify on, uh, by that slack variable, by the distance, which is proportions to that slack variable, until they got onto the, their correct side of the margin. That's the basic interpretation. So you have these slack variables. And um, and before you know, with linearly separable data, uh, the maximizing margin problem we showed was equivalent to minimizing the norm of beta subject to y i times x i transpose beta is greater than or equal to one, because this was the condition for linear separability, if you recall. And this uh, norm of beta is inverse is reciprocally proportion um, related to the the width of the margin. We want to minimize this norm of beta, thus maximizing the margin, subject to the separation uh, property. But no longer. But what if this isn't feasible? What if there does not exist such a beta, such that you can uh, you can find you can get this to hold for all i? So if it's not separable, then we have to introduce these slack variables, and basically all they are is um, we're going to uh, remove this this slack from this one until this holds. So, you know, if this doesn't hold for one, let's remove a slack variable for each i until it does hold. So we're going to do that. And we're just going to say um, this slack variable is equal to one minus yi times xi transpose beta if, um, if this is wrong and zero otherwise. So this is what we call the slack variable. It's just what we need to remove from one until this does hold. Um, and then what we're going to do is in, instead of now we're just going to introduce these slack variables into the objective. So we're just going to say let's minimize the norm of beta squared plus c times the sum over i of the slack variables. So this is equivalent to minimizing the sum over the slack variables plus lambda times uh, the norm of beta squared, where lambda is 1 over c. All I did was just multiply everything by 1 over c and call that lambda. Now, if you look at this, this is going to start to look very familiar. So if you look at this, this slack variable is just the positive part of 1 minus yi times xi transpose beta. And uh, when, when this is positive, right? and 0 if it's not positive. Right? And so that's, uh, that's exactly the hinge loss. And so this turns out just to be exactly um, the, the problem that I stated before with the ridge regularization term. Okay, so if we, if we look back at what this means, we have these hinge losses on this side. Um, we have uh, these points are incorrectly classified. We had to, if we think about the margin interpretation, we had to pull these over by the amount, which is their slack variables, to get them to be on this side of the separator. Similarly, with these points, these points all needed some slack to get them onto the, to get them outside of the margin. Right. And same with these blue points. But critically, no slack had to be added to points that were on the correct side of the margin, which is why this interpretation is consistent with the hinge loss 
because the hinge loss is zero in this case, which means the slack that's required to separate them is zero. Okay, so uh, one good exercise to do is to just review the logistic loss and the hinge loss and just see what are their gradients and subdifferentials. Um, so, uh, so take a take a, a minute or two to try to to just derive the gradients and subdifferentials for these. So you just have to identify whether they're whether they're differentiable or not, and then and then what are the and try to look for some pattern between these two if they take a similar form. Okay, take a minute, and we'll return in a second, and just pause, and and I'll return. Okay. So I'll answer this question. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you take the logistic loss, we can take its gradient with respect to beta. And uh, we just use the chain rule. So we get this minus, the gradient of this inner part is xi times minus yi. So we get minus yi times uh, the gradient of the log, which is uh, the gradient of this part divided by the derivative of this part divided by this. Um, the the full inner part. So we get minus yi times the exponential of minus yi beta transpose xi over one plus exponential minus yi times beta transpose xi times xi. Okay. So you get something that looks like minus yi times something that's between zero and one critically uh, times xi. That's what the gradient is. Now um, you might see that this in, uh, when you encode y as 1 and 0, you might have seen that the gradient has a very nice form, and it's the probability of y being 1 under the logistic model minus y times xi. Um, and you can actually verify this. You can rewrite this thing as this part as minus yi times 1 minus the probability of y given x, the observed y given x. And when this is 1, you can see that when y is 1, um, then you can see that this is the, this, um, you get uh, yi is 1 here. So you have minus minus the probability, which is just the probability. And then uh, you have minus yi from this, from this component. So you get the probability that y is equal to 1 minus, um, minus y. And this only works when you encode y as a 0, 1. One way to do that is just to write it as an indicator that yi is equal to 1. And it's this times xi. Uh, and you can also look at what happens when yi is equal to minus 1. In that case, you have that this 1 minus the probability of yi uh, given xi is the probability that yi is equal to 1. You have this component appears. And then you have minus yi, which is um, which in this case is going to be uh, just one, right? So this is zero. So you just end up getting the probability that y is equal to one times xi. So this verifies the uh, simple form for the gradient that you see in, um, in say, uh, the elements of statistical learning because they encode their binary variable, their response variable as a zero and a one. Okay. So let's look at the hinge laws. So the subdifferential of the positive part is just one if A is positive and zero otherwise. That's, uh, sorry, and zero if it's negative, and then it's between zero and one if A is equal to one. And you can just use the chain rule just like we had before. And there's not really a, a r much nicer form than that. Um, so that's the subdifferential. Um, a, a good subgradient is just to set uh, this, this uh, subgradient equal to 0 if, um, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if this inner part is equal to 0. Right. Now, critically, uh, this, this subdifferential is between 0 and 1 for the positive part. And so this also, because of the chain rule, looks like minus yi times eta i times xi, where eta is between 0 and 1. It just takes the value 0 and takes the value 1 in most cases, except when, um, yeah. And it, if we choose the subgradient to be 0 when it, when it can be 0, then it is either 0 or 1. 
And so if we contrast that to what we had for the logistic regression, here we have something that lies strictly between 0 and 1. Right? But they take the same form. Your, um, yeah. Okay, thank you.